Hello and welcome to the last Guardian film show of 2015. Here to unwrap and then wrap about the Christmas releases. So, season's greetings. Settle back, pour yourself a glass of something. The Guardian film show is here to bring joy to the world and two other films too. Mr. Chase! Coming up this Christmas. A whale, sir. It stove the ship. Chris Hemsworth what? meets a monster in the surging, salt crusted maritime drama in the heart of the sea. The pups are useless, sir. My darling. Hola. Let me introduce. And Eddie Redmayne and Alicia Vikander are both going through changes in the Danish girl. I know his cousin from Viola. My dear. Exquisite. <laughs> but of course, the season demands that we begin with joy, a skittish Horatio Alger style tale of the can do American spirit, starring Jennifer Lawrence as the hard scrabble inventor of the Miracle Mop. Catherine Shaw sat down with the film's writer director, David O. Russell. Hi. What are you doing here? I'm returning him to you. I don't want him anymore. What? <sighs> He's damaged. He has no place else to go. He's been living in my house for two years. Oh, Dad, I'm so sorry. Yeah. But, you know, Tony's living in the basement. Your ex-husband shouldn't be living in your basement. That's not the proper way to be divorced. I want her to be haunted by dreams and nightmares, um, which are purely emotional and not literal, which is what makes them cinematic to me, that these things are happening and they're very specific. She's in her mother's soap opera. She, her, her family's there. She's being chloroformed. Is she literally being chloroformed by her family? Are they trying to kill her? No, it's an emotional thing. It's just an emotion. You wake up and then you feel guilty because you pictured your family as chloroformers, but then you don't, you don't know what to make of it. I've woken up from a nightmare many times and had that. You're in church, it's beautiful. There's a choir singing. It's a funeral, what is it? It's, a, it's my funeral. You wake up and you just know, what? These are wake-up telegrams uh, from the great beyond. Um, and I like that she has these, and I've had these, you know, wake-up telegrams, uh, being haunted by the dreams of her youth. As you grow up and come into the world that has all sorts of things in it, money, crime, betrayal, it seems like you're shaking us down. You can pay more. I can't, and I won't. And you realize that the only thing you're gonna have is what you make. The sublime can happen very unexpectedly, as Yates said. You can just be sitting in a tea shop, and all of a sudden you can feel blessed and blessing. Mm, why at that moment? It can be a totally banal moment. So these are the things we look for in the ordinary, our cinema of the ordinary, which um, aspires to be extraordinary. You are in a room, and there is a gun on the table. I want my life to be other person in the room is an adversary in commerce. Only one of you can prevail. Do you pick up the gun, Joy? I pick up the gun. Joined in the glittering Winter Wonderland style grotto of the Guardian film show by Peter Bradshaw and Catherine Short. Peter, David O. Russell is such a kind of distinctive, interesting filmmaker. Yeah. Is Joy right up there with his best? No, I don't think it is. I really wanted it to be, but it's not. There's something weirdly tonally uncertain about this. It, the, the, the fascinating thing about this film is that it's a true story. It really did happen. There really was this woman who went on QVC and made a smash hit with her own miracle self-ringing mop. But clearly, David O. Russell thinks, well, I can't just play that like a straightforward, underdog, inspirational story. I have to put a bit of funkiness in mm. there. And yet, the problem is, how far is she to be ironised? Right. How are we, are we taking a mickey out of her? Yeah. Are we looking askance at her in the way that we are looking askance and taking a mickey out of the characters in, say, American Hustle? They were loosely based on true, other true stories as well. But clearly, they're not the good guys. They, they are to be laughed at and laughed with a little bit. But clearly, there's a, a kind of ironic funkiness going on there. And there is in all of David O. Russell's best work. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, I think he doesn't know how to handle the idea of here is this woman and I'm on her side. Right. And I think something. So there's goes still an blank. ambivalence. There's there. an ambivalence, but it's not simply an ambivalence, and not even sort of teetering on a fence. It's just a kind of blank where the flavour should be, weirdly. Uh, and I think nothing in the film lives up to that extraordinary first shot, mm. the un, un kind of constructed master shot of a daytime soap. And you think, what the heck is going on here? And afterwards, you're thinking, uh, okay. I get it. She was brought up watching this kind of daytime soap, 
And then she goes on TV in roughly the same context, which in these QVC shows, which are being presented by old daytime soap stars. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, OK, I kind of get it. But even there, I think so it's ironic, is it, that, that we're living in this weird, trashy, sort of nerdy little world of daytime soap? No, we're not, because we've got to get on her side and she looks wonderful. And Jennifer Lawrence kind of strides out and she looks like a fashion plate. She looks absolutely glorious. There's a scene in, in the, the movie where she's striding down the street in Texas wearing those wonderful sunglasses with a new hairstyle. And you think, God, she just looks sensational. She really does. And yet it why does she look sensational? I, I don't quite believe the preceding scene, and I don't believe the scene that succeeds it, but I certainly believe that she looks good. And it, everything kind of seems really free-floating and strange, and I try as I might, I couldn't make friends with this film, and I don't believe in my heart that David O. Russell nailed the tone and the storytelling style of it. You said to me that David Selznick, the son of immigrants, married Jennifer Jones, an all-American girl from Oklahoma because in America, all races and all classes can meet and make whatever opportunities they can. And that is what you feel when you reach into people's homes with what you sell. It's a fascinating story, though. It's a story about the selling of American products, though, isn't it? Whether it's her or her mop, and how those are framed as cheesy stories. So it's kind of, it's following that template, but it's, it's riffing on it as well. Yeah, I think it's really intricate what they've done with the with with how that all meshes together in the soap opera elements, the dream elements. See, there's much more surrealism in this than there is certainly in his last two. Uh, I think it's actually really intricately done. I agree with Peter that there's a problem in that it's this hagiographic look at a woman's life, which probably doesn't bear, in many cases, resemblance to what happened. I mean, she went to university, she had three kids, there's issues. Uh, and especially towards the end... It, it loses it for me in, in terms of that. And you, so you have that strange thing and you have that strange uh, uncertainty about the extent to which we have any scepticism about Joy herself. Mm. But you also have this kind of classic David O. Russell bickering family, mm. fantastically engaging and... Um, You've got De Niro as the dad. Mm. Yeah, and Rossellini as his new yeah. girlfriend, mm. who's just wonderful. Well, I guess as a filmmaker, he's a part of the world that he is documenting. So do you feel that he's got enough distance on the material or is he confusing almost himself on working on all these different levels. I think it's interesting who he's identifying with. Is he identifying with Jennifer Lawrence in creating the world and having had this seven, she has a 17 year period in which her dreams are subsumed and she sort of lost, loses her way creatively. He famously had quite a long mm. period in, one, in which that happened as well. Or is he in fact identifying with the Bradley Cooper kind of ringmaster director uh, tycoon figure who makes a star out of her. I mean in both this film and the last two, the, all the films he's made with it there is a scene in which Jennifer Lawrence puts on a show you know there is a sort of stagey scene like that and it's interesting I, I don't know and I don't understand I think there's a lot going on here um, much more than, than might meet the eye. The problem I have with this film is that I don't think it's saying anything about her at all it's riffing basically mm -hmm. on the idea of her he, he's got some great set pieces some great stylish moments some great signature ensemble moments, and it's just riffing and mixing and matching. I mean, there's a moment, this moment, where she gets so annoyed she, with the scene in her father's uh, auto repair shop, she just comes out to Elvis Presley's A Little Less Conversation, comes out, grabs the shotgun from somebody, and just whacks away at a target. And you're thinking, wow, that's a, a great scene. I, I love this. What does it mean? Where, where are we going with this? The answer is really nowhere. It's just, it's just, it just looks great. And then we're going to drift into another scene that looks great. It's to me, it's like a kind of montage or a trailer. Listen to me. Never speak on my behalf about my business again. Jennifer Lawrence hoping to mop up come Oscar time as Joy. We now move on to the true life backstory of Moby Dick and in the heart of the sea the tale of a vast white whale and a whole heap of water. Here's director Ron Howard and star Chris Hemsworth to put Andrew Pulver in the picture, though unfortunately not literally. Was this really a way of making a Moby Dick adaptation without actually doing Moby Dick? 
That's what I thought when I first read the script, and I wasn't so interested in that, uh, even though I really admired the script. He didn't want to do another Moby Dick by any means, and, and what fascinated him about this was it was the true events that inspired that story, but it was its own unique telling of, of these events that, um, that I think people hadn't seen before. When I discovered that, I thought, well, now now we're into some fresh territory. Now we're actually revealing something people didn't know. I didn't know, and I like history. Mr. Chase! A whale, sir. It stove the ship. What? We lost Easton and Sanborn. Of course, this is the sixth movie I've made based on real events, so I do love those extreme stories that you sort of can't deny because they really happened. The hell is shit jammed! Gas is still all clear! you can trust Ron Howard to come up with some good old school entertainment for Christmas. Yes, that's what he's done, that's what he's done. I've got a bit of a soft spot for an old fashioned seafaring yarn. I like uh, this sort of thing where you've got two people quarreling in mm. charge of a big ship. There's a sort of mutiny on the bounty mm. thing going on. You see, I like a good sort of sea shanty as well. Yeah. And yet this one bored me rigid. I didn't I did. believe in it for a second. I did, uh, I d I did enjoy it. Uh, I'm. I'm not sure that I believed it, but I thought there were interesting things going on in it. I thought was interesting about it is that it wasn't so much man versus whale but sort of man versus man. I mm. quite like the fact that it's in two parts. It's not just about fighting with this whale, the great white whale. No, and hardly the rest at all. Of it. Hardly at all. And then you've got this uh, classic kind of, oh my God, we're cast adrift on an open yeah. boat and we're dying slowly. Now, again, I've got a real soft spot for that kind of story as well. I love that. Although I don't like the sort of life of pie nonsense about an imaginary tiger being on the, mm. on the lifeboat. But I do quite like the idea of, oh my God, it's day 78. Yes. And, I, and you get all that, don't and you? And you get all that. And I love all Still 2,000 <laughs> yes, miles that, from you know, shore. Sort of more and more beards and they're more and more dead dying. He, and then, he was, he remained, Chris Hemsworth remained suspiciously well upholstered. Yeah, he I didn't thought look, he was squirreling way is rational. Yeah, Everybody else gets yes, emaciated exactly. and he's still a hunk. But Exactly, but I thought there was something almost inadvertently, it says something interesting about the origin of Moby Dick in that what happened was Herman Melville partly, but only partly took the story of, Ho of, of, of Moby Dick from a real life incident yeah. in 1820 where a whaling ship called the Essex was sunk and its survivors, of, of whom there are about, about half a dozen, basically got through it uh, and they were running out of food, they were running out of water, and, as they say, were confronted with terrible, horrible choices about what they were going to have to do to stay alive. Now, when they finally got back to shore, they told a terrifying story about being attacked by a whale. Mm. And I think what this film does, possibly inadvertently, is give you an interesting, and for me, kind of very novel, insight into what happened and how the myth of the whale took place. In what how people you externalised the horror. They externalised the real horror was what they had to do to survive. Mm -hmm. And what these people were doing was they couldn't bear to admit to themselves or to each other or to the public and what, what really happened. Yeah. And so as a kind of mental diversionary tactic, they exaggerated or perhaps in, even in some sense invented the idea of the terrifying whale as a kind of rationalization, as you say, a projection of, of something that was happening behind the public's back, which is the real horror. And I have to say, Ron Howard's film cast an interesting light on that. I Does it? Have, well, because the way you say that, that sounds fascinating. I'd have loved to have seen that film. This well, isn't that film. Well, This is a film where you've occasionally got this very blank leviathan coming up there yeah. and goes, there he is again. I, yeah, um, I know. It's then they don't know quite straight. what to do with it. I don't know. It's done straight. It's pretty straight. But I think there were some good things in it. I love the idea that they had to bore a hole in the, the first whale's skull mm -hmm. and somebody's got to get down into it. 
And I thought that was a horrible scene. And again, I've never seen it done before, but what exactly you have to do to get whale oil and the blubber that was the precious stuff is inside the skull of mm. that. And you, somebody, the 14 year old cabin boy has to scramble in like Jonah and get mm. inside the whale. And I thought that was really horrible. And I thought that was a good moment. Mr. Lawrence. The hunters turn hunted in Ron Howard's In the Heart of the Sea. Just time for one last big Oscar contender before the curtain comes down. Say hello to the Danish girl. But did it go well? Tell me, how was it? Eddie Redmayne stars as Ina, an acclaimed landscape painter in 1920s Copenhagen. And Eddie Redmayne stars as Lily, the subject in a series of acclaimed oil portraits. Alicia Vikander is the woman in the middle. Her marriage in tatters, the future uncertain. That was you and I now. Stop playing that stupid, stupid game. Please, Gerda. Don't you think this is a game? Catherine, um, Eddie Redman obviously won the Best Actor Oscar last year. I really hope he doesn't do it for this one. Why? I thought he was terrible in this. In what way? His, his script notes seem to be smile, do a little giggle, and then, then look demurely to the ground. And that seemed to be what he did for, for two whole hours. I thought this was really poor. I'm afraid, yeah, we have done quite a lot of impressions in the office of Eddie Redmayne. Andrew Pulvers is especially fun. Oh, I can, yeah, and sort of he's, quite arousing, I would yeah. imagine. <laughs> Very confusing, certainly. Um, yes, I think Eddie Redmayne's habit as um, Lily of the simper and the giggle and the downward look is... So irritating. And so overplayed. You know, and you sort of feel, oh, God, am I terribly prejudiced? Is it just that you know, he's a woman? It's not that. It's just fantastically annoying. <laughs> you just want to absolutely slap her the whole way through. Um, yes, it's a problem that. Actually, I don't think it's a bad performance. And I think the fact that I'm so pissed off by it is an indication that it's quite convincing. I think Eddie Redmayne is quite good in this, actually. I think um, lots of other things about the film are, are not. I mean, uh, Matthew Schoenartz is, is Matthew mm. Schoenartz. The script is dreadful. The direction is painful. Um, uh, Alicia is fine, but has very little to do. Um, the whole thing is sort of massively misconceived, isn't it? But I, actually, I don't think Eddie Redmayne's bad. I just think it's completely Is it charmed. misconceived or, or mishandled? I just thought that Tom Hooper wasn't perhaps the right director for this material. It felt a bit like a kind of very stolid, conservative take on, the, the, on a, a material that should be treated with much more kind of fluency and exoticism. Potentially, but, I mean, if you read the original sort of fictionalised book by David somebody, I forget his name. Oh, yeah, so David sorry, Ebersoff, yeah. It's bloody awful. Is I mean, it? it's so flowery and sort of repellent. Um, that I do, you know, it's quite, it's quite o of a kin with this. I mean, I think, you know, there is a problem in that it's massively oversensitively handled. Mm. So, you know, uh, she's sort of even undergoing very graphic <laughs> surgery. It's all very pretty yeah. and giggly. He just felt kind of embarrassed by it, the director. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes, that's true. I kissed him. And it was the strangest thing. It was like kissing myself. These two won't be staying much longer. Unmarried people are so delightfully easy to shock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that I totally agree. I know what you mean. I, I sat down to this thinking I was going to hate it. And in fact, I found myself thinking that there were some good things about it. Uh, I think Tom Hooper does a very formally accomplished job. I think he sets down... He, it looks oddly like the King's Speech in some ways, the idea of a sort of Pygmalion transformation, mm. something remedial. Also, the interior spaces, those gigantic mm. Mm. kind of bleached wood spaces, really oddly similar to the King's Speech. I know what you mean about Eddie Redmayne's performance. I, I think the problem I had with it is maybe a problem with the subject matter. I wanted to know, well, what happened to his career as an artist, as yeah, a creator? Just he just abandoned mm. it and became this sort of simpering model mm. for, for his wife. And I thought, well, if that's the story, that it's about his wife's talent. Yes, and him that, as the catalyst that him for the her. him as the catalyst and almost a sacrificial catalyst for her. Again, that's interesting. Mm. And again, and I'm not sure that, that the film neglected that, but... I think the problem is the film covers everything with a patina of prettiness and good taste. Yeah. And it's as if it's saying that their prettiness is what entitles them to their, 
to their gender identity. That if he wants to be a woman, that's fine because he looks so pretty anyway. Mm, if you're not pretty, yeah. then no, you're not entitled to. But fortunately, Eddie Redmayne is is so pretty that of course he's entitled to it. It's very popular. So I, I I didn't mind this film. I thought it was actually formally accomplished, and I thought Alicia uh, Alicia, Alicia Vikander was very good. I guess fittingly though, it's it's a sort of Star is Born thing that it follows the, the the line of the film to a degree in that Vikander almost trumps Eddie Redmayne who is the star of it I thought in terms of her performance yeah I think she's great and um, she is one of those you know so ex machina and I mean I thought she was really good in Testament of You mm. standing up for, yeah I know, I know but I mean and in America she's a particularly good thing and I think for instance she would have been great as the lead in the Star Wars film. She's a bit kind of not, not a newcomer, but she's the right age. She would have been so much better. She's too kind of perfectly pretty, though, isn't she? Oh, God. To play a scavenger on it's a so desert planet. It? Jesus. I mean, Daisy Ridley sounds like she's, you know, just been, just graduated St Paul's, you know, <laughs> she's, yet she's a scavenger. Mm. I mean, I think if you're... If you're <laughs> the yeah, if you're in Hollywood, fairly, then, you know, um, it's all relative. But I think, I, think the, I think the prettiness is a problem here because you've got... You know, it dodges things like, you know, it dodges the interesting things about the real story, yeah. like the womb transplant and the sort of mm. slightly battiness of that. And the fact that um, uh, Lily fell in love with her surgeon, completely fell in love with him. And it, that was an interesting relationship mm. that would have been more interesting to see. And I think in sort of prettifying it, including for Vikanda, the problem that she is so remorselessly sympathetic and supportive and nice mm. that it's kind of, a, she's a great performance, but... There's not much to do in the part in a funny kind of way because all she can do is just be astonishingly nice, you know, mm. throughout, weirdly nice. The first time we met, I was leaving the academy and she was sitting on the steps flaunting said ankles. And she propositioned me. Is that true? When I said hello to him, he actually blushed. He was so shy, so I asked him out. And you said yes. Well, she made me. <laughs> She seemed so sure. I was sure. I still am. Eddie Redmayne and Alicia Vikander in The Danish Girl. And that's it. The film year is over and Christmas comes upon us like a hurtling freight train. My thanks to Peter and Catherine. Our thanks as ever to you for watching. Happy Christmas. Look after yourselves. We're back. Nursing hangovers in 2016. We're clearing the decks to make way for the biggest film of the year, one that comes trailing a tangled, checkered 40-year history. So, it's the first order of business, it's the last order of business, it's Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens.